Hey friends, thank you for joining me today. I am just getting the last few things cleaned up. Here, here's a tip. I'm never sure. Not, I probably never mentioned this. I got into the habit years ago when using brush cleaners like Gamsol, Sansoder, Turbinoid, and so forth. <clears throat> I always have them in a bucket, in a bucket, or in a container, in a container. Um, it just contains the, the splashing a little bit and uh, cuts down waste. I didn't think anything of it. One time I was taking a, you can see that right down there, see here? I was taking a class from a, one of the big shot painters. <laughs> And uh, he made a comment on it, like, oh, that was a clever idea. I'm sure, I'm sure he said it with that exact tone of voice, too. Trust me. <laughs> okay. I might be dramatizing it just a little bit. Or dramatizing it. To be even more drama dramatic. Okay, let's get to work on pa this painting. Let me start this on Friday, I think five days ago. And it has taken me a long time to get back to it. Now, before I started the video... I will tell you, <clears throat> this is aluminum, right? <laughs> clang, clang, clang. Um, so I can't use my normal jumbo jet black. Oh, I guess I could have a little bit. Anyway, I used a grease pencil. Oh, China marker. I mean, I should say China marker. Uh, when I started using pencils in my oil paintings several years ago now, China markers was one of the things I played around and experimented with. Decided they were a little too greasy, but I felt like it was just about perfect for aluminum. So, of course, everything on here then is dry. And uh, so I can slap stuff down. I, I went through considerable debate here in the last few minutes. I'm still debating, evidently, whether to do darks first, and next, and then lights. So I did dark pencil, and I'm doing light. Not I'm going to stick with it. I, I'm, again, I'm almost deciding to change change direction here at the last second, but I'm going to stick with it. So we are doing pretty much straight oil paint on this dry underpainting. Now, I find myself in this actually very common predicament. Is that, that might be putting it too strong. Strong, a, a very common, slightly challenging place. <laughs> I'm struggling for words, aren't I? Where, because this painting is small, in fact, for my taste, infuriatingly small, <laughs> And because it's on aluminum, because it's a strange medium to me, a strange surface, my, I think, correct in, uh, intuition is to paint a little <clears throat> tighter than normal. Now, I, I talked about this quite a bit last Friday. I'll, I'll, let me just repeat it very briefly for those of you who didn't hear me last Friday. Here, here was a, a general principle that I think has served me well uh, several times throughout the years, and it is this. Anytime you're doing artwork in a new medium, you're in virgin territory. I used the example the other day of oil pastels. You know, one of those slightly oddball mediums. <laughs> <laughs> and I might add the kind of stuff that if you took high school art, the kind of stuff that your high school art teacher made you do. Okay, so anytime you find yourself in virgin territory, as I am here, and I've, I've done three or four, I can't remember, but I, I would consider that still virgin territory. I'm far, 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 far from uh, an expert on painting on aluminum. You with me? Okay, so anytime you find yourself there, 
my counsel is to wrestle the medium into submission rather than giving in to the opposite impulse, which is <clears throat> to, to go with it, so to speak, to, oh, my wife's calling me. I just started this broadcast. I hope she's all right. I'm going to have to call her back later. Um, rather than, um, there's two ways, and again, I, I'm getting in this deeper than I intended to because I said all this already on Friday, but okay, you guys, not all of you were watching, so here it is. They're, they're generally, to be overly binary about it, <clears throat> you philosophers will appreciate that, uh, there are two ways to handle every medium. One way is to submit to the idiosyncrasies of that medium. Let it have its natural course. And I'm insinuating in that a more abstract style of illustration or painting because you're allowing the medium to, to have primary sway. Now, I don't think I mentioned this uh, on Friday, so let me repeat it. The, <laughs> the most extraordinary, brilliant, and hilarious example I ever saw of this was, goodness, somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago. Back in my street painting days, I used to, you know, the chalk on the street thing? I used to do that. I did for five or six years. I did it several times in competitions and in and for corporations and ad agencies, both. <clears throat> anyway, back in those days, I was doing a street painting competition. And late in the day, this guy named Lloyd. Hello, Mark Toomey. Good to see you again, my friend. Uh, this, this guy named Lloyd Skidmore. Bless his heart, what a name, Skidmore. <laughs> well, he was a genius artist. <coughs> he is from Raleigh, North Carolina. And he was coming to the Street Painting Festival. Now, he, you've actually probably seen his work. If everybody who's seen the movie Alien, Lloyd Skidmore designed the props the spaceship for, for the movie Alien. So that's his number one claim to fame. He was one of those bohemian in the absolute most classic sense of the word. With a name like Skidmore, or he struggled with alcohol. I say this with great compassion. I'm not judging him at all, I'm just, but it's just part of the story. Anyway, <clears throat> I have great respect for him. He passed away several years ago. And, uh, he showed up at the street painting festival, <laughs> get this, with a great big box. All of us have all our colored chalk, right? He showed up with a big box of white school chalk, you know, chalkboard chalk. Third grade English teacher, math teacher, chalkboard chalk, a great big box. Thousands of pieces of white chalk. I mean, heck, he heard, he heard it was chalk on the street so he brought chalk and <laughs> a big bag of charcoal like barbecue charcoal <laughs> and he did some kind of crazy thing and he won an award that year he won something some kind of award there must have been some pretty artsy judges because they, they got off on what he was doing. I did too. I thought it was hilarious. I would have been so I wouldn't have been so happy if he had beat me, which he didn't, but I beat him, but <laughs> you didn't need to know that. Just one more opportunity for me to for my ego to get out of the bag a little bit. Yeah, I won that year again. But anyway, Lloyd Skidmore. So that's an example of a, <laughs> a ridiculous example of letting the medium be the medium, letting it be what it is and not trying to arm wrestle it into submission. Um, that's one way to handle all mediums. So let me give a, a very common example. <clears throat> this would be 
one way to describe the kind of watercolor painters that allow their watercolor paints to flow and run and blossom and that's a watercolor term and do all do all those watercolor things okay so that's that's the first category the second category is usually in the service of realism uh, you can take any medium and as i say arm wrestle it into submission force it you be the master you control it and so on right generally speaking you can kind of look at everybody's artwork and analyze it according to that again overly binary uh, analysis in my oil regular oil painting I would, I would like to just about split that right down the middle I allow the oil paints to be very paint painty painterly and yet at the same time I'm I am forcing it I might be putting it too strongly for my taste but creating uh, a very fairly realistic images with it okay so back to <laughs> this turned into a very long 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 way around the block to say I have discovered that anytime I'm working in a brand new medium virgin territory it behooves me I do better if I go the arm wrestling route so here I am, virgin territory, painting on aluminum. So rather than, in a sense, giving in and letting the aluminum do all kinds of crazy, crazy things to me, in order to learn the, the uh, idiosyncrasies of aluminum, I'm going to do a slightly tighter, and I hope you're hearing that word slight, right? I'm going to do a slightly tighter style of painting than I might than I would do if I were working in my in familiar territory, which for me, of course, is uh, acrylics and oil on canvas. So this is me being tight. Okay, now having said all that, the real challenge I face then is if I can use if I can mess up language is to be tight without being tight <laughs> oh boy and all you artists really all the art types you, you guys know what i mean how to be tight without being tight so i'm going to be working quite hard to make interesting marks my favorite way to describe the the essence of good painting A lot of energy in there, right? A lot, lot, lot of energy. Hard edges, high contrast. Both of those. Now, of course, if I decide it's too much, I might pick up a fan brush and just scribble over that a little bit. But I'm not going to do that yet. I'm gonna... But I am getting looser up here. I don't feel noticed. My edges the edges of my the marks that I'm making are softer, fuzzier, messier. You have even gotten a finger in there. Okay. Uh, those of you who are beginner painters or perhaps slightly less along the painting journey than myself, you I, I would invite you to pay very careful attention to how I'm holding my brushes, I'll zoom out just a little bit so you can see that, how I'm holding them. Every stroke that I've put down on the canvas, <laughs> on the aluminum so far, has been with the side of my brush. And of course, I'm using two hands. That helps a lot. I invite you to try it. <clears throat> when you use two hands, you will feel like you're completely out of control. Just ignore that feeling and keep doing it. I used my left hand, my non-dominant hand, for several years before it started feeling normal. I did, I, there's no question I developed some, some degree of ambidexterity by, by painting with two hands. 
I know that primarily because now when I play catch with my grandson, it's a lot. I, I, I enjoy playing catch with my left, throwing with my left hand. Pardon me for drinking in front of you. I am fighting, as you can probably tell, I'm fighting another cold, my <laughs> second cold of the season. Golly, for somebody who takes good care of themselves. <laughs> I've had my share of colds this year, the second one this season. Anyway, so sorry about that. <clears throat> All right. I like that. I like that pretty much. I am, in fact, I'm looking for a fan brush. Here it is. I am, in fact, going to do what I said just a minute ago and just come in here and soften. You can hardly even tell what I'm doing. It's not like it's not like I, I well, I suppose if I zeroed in and looked at one little spot, I could see what I'm doing. But that's not what I'm doing. I'm just I can see it getting soft. I'm I'm looking with my unfocused eyes. Do you know what I mean by that? I'm I'm not. Okay, I have to remember to clean that brush later. So let's put it over here. And again, here's another trick. This works really well on aluminum scratching with the handle of your brush <clears throat> so again how do you render trees the answer is with a process with layers uh, with multiple multiple layers this is a these branches would fit the description of highly re highly repeated motif similar act similar shapes over and over and over and whenever you do that you have to come up with a variety of techniques for rendering that repetitious stroke. Otherwise, it will be boring. Okay, I'm going to leave the sky for a while. Hallelujah. Just about when you get tired of doing something, you get to move on to something else. That's the nice thing about painting. <clears throat> and for those of you who didn't watch, and I see a lot of chats down there, can't wait to can't wait wait to see what you guys have been saying. Um, I did two sketches for this project one no tan basically light medium and dark <clears throat> and then one in color and in both cases i d defined my dark area very clearly it's sort of like a lowercase uh d d as in dog lowercase d do you see that right there that's the dark and then the medium comes down the left of it around the bottom and up here so it's actually maybe a j outside the outside the lowercase b and then the light areas are scattered so i want to continue to follow that pattern i've, I've already worked out some of those issues and i'm not going to repeat all of that thinking again here today it ha it's related to composition composition is related to it is composition is actually talking about the major light and dark zones in a painting. That's all I'm going to say about that right now. <laughs> you keep, well, if you haven't watched me, heard me, heard, if you haven't heard that lecture before, just keep watching me. I will come around again. I, <laughs> those of you who watch me regularly know. <laughs> I only have 14 things to say. I just keep saying them over and over and over and over. I hope, I hope that's an exaggeration. I do use my fingers when I paint, and that's part of the reason why I'm careful not to use any toxic pigment colors. I don't use cadmiums or cobalts. Jury's still out how toxic they are. Some people swear up and down that they're not toxic. Other people swear up and down that they are. So there's a whole lot of swearing going on, but nobody really knows what the truth is. So I say, eh, why take the chance if I want to paint for another 30 years? <laughs> what do you think? I'll be 94 in 30 years. Hey, Maxfield Parrish did it. <clears throat> there you go. If he, if he did it, I'll make that my goal. Anyway, if I want to live for a long time, <laughs> I'll try to avoid... By the way, I happen to know that he actually did use a lot of cobalt so there you go. I don't know. Maybe that, that's just a one case study. <laughs> mm. 
I'm use I'm painting a whoops and I'm so sorry gang. There we go. Sorry about that. I'm painting a very pale yellow or, or really yellow ochre. So warm yellow. a little bit down here in the in the foreground I had a what I consider a mentor. We didn't actually, you know, meet one on one ever, <clears throat> but he was a very good artist who uh, lived in Raleigh many years ago when I first moved here, thirty years ago. Named uh, Neil Watson. I've talked about him before, and uh, I made I made him my mentor simply because I paid a lot of attention to what he said, because I, he was good. And uh, if he were here now, I would latch myself onto him and say, I'll pay you, be my mentor. But I didn't know enough to do that back then, so I just got him in public meetings. We were both a part of an organization called the um, North Carolina Association of Designers and illustrators. And he was very gracious enough to join a group with such a name because he actually, he really wasn't an illustrator. <clears throat> he was a fine artist. Anyway, um, Neil Watson, we've looked him up. Bruno over in Germany looked him up one time and found out sort of what happened to him. Passed away several years ago. And um, I'm saying his, I'm mentioning him because he had an expression, he had a saying, one of the things I remember so well. He said, for every drawing mark that you make, you should make an art mark. Now, I, I think he was exaggerating to make the point, and it was, it was worth exaggerating to make the point. I don't think he really meant one for one, but that's what he said. For every art mark that you make, you should pause. No, no, for every drawing mark, you should pause and make an art mark. Of course, I guess you could say it the other way around too. But <clears throat> and what he called an art mark was any mark on your painting or drawing that wasn't definitive, that didn't that didn't really aid in the similitude, realism, drawing of the subject matter. It was just, just an interesting mark. And again, I've, I've always considered that to be an exaggeration, and I still do. But, it's a big but coming here. I now think he was actually closer to the mark than I have given him credit for. Um, I've tried to do that principle, just not to the degree that he has expressed. So for instance, what I just did right there, that's an art mark. Had no, has nothing to do, I'm just slapping on the painting. I'm just making a little mess on the painting. That's what he meant by an art mark. <clears throat> it could be a spatter, a splatter. A smoosh, a smudge, uh, just a random. And uh, in that my current part of my painting journey, I'm taking him a, that that uh, recommendation a little more seriously than I used to. <clears throat> I don't know if you know this or not. You probably do. 
one of the there's a lot of great things about being an artist. One is the lo longevity of it. That you can be an artist, <clears throat> a good artist, late in life. Uh, unlike almost, you know, every other area of human endeavor. Of course, if you're an athlete, you're done by the time you're 35 or 40 in almost every field of athletics. Uh, if you're a musician, I'm a trumpet player. And Adolf Herseth, one of the legendary trumpet players of the 20th century, was first chair trumpet in the Chicago Symphony. Again, probably nobody listening to me is a... There are not very many of will be classic music aficionados, but the the the, Cle the, the uh, Chicago Symphony was a, a world class symphony at the time, and and was especially famous for its brass section, referred to back in the day as the Chicago Sound. <clears throat> well, Adolf Herseth was the leader of the brass section. He was the first chair trumpet. And the reason I mentioned him is because he was first chair trumpet in the what could arguably, what could be argued as the most prominent brass section in the world until the age of 79 or 80. That is almost superhuman. Playing trumpet is a very physical activity, more physical than I think any other instrument, except perhaps French horn, maybe trombone. But th those three, without question, are the most, and I think trumpet is the most. Anyway, so that that's extraordinary. My point being, <laughs> some musicians can go into old age, but most can't. Most cannot. And here's the good news, painters, artists, if, if we can keep our eyes and keep our hands and keep our life, <laughs> we can paint right on up into old age. Maxfield Parrish, one of my heroes, <clears throat> he was, I describe him as the Norman Rockwell, one generation earlier than Norman Rockwell, and sort of one tick, one tick more continental, European. Italian, he studied in Italy, you know, a little bit more tech, uh, legit than, than Mac, uh, uh, even though uh, Norman Rockwell is a fabulous painter. You can't really see that until you look at his originals, until you look at his real paintings and go, doggone, he was a real painter. Um, Maxfield Parrish <clears throat> died at age 95, I believe. You can Google it, correct me if I'm wrong. <coughs> And I think he did his last painting when he was 95, maybe 94. Good painting. Good painting. So there you go. He's one of my heroes. Um, there was some reason I got into that subject. Now I forget what it was. Anyway, it, it's so good that we get, that it's one of the blessings that we can paint into old age. There was, there was something related. I was going to say something related to that. It'll come back to me if it's important. <coughs> you, and you could probably hardly see what I'm doing here because I'm the color that I'm putting on is so um, similar to what's already there, but it's changing. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna make a jump here. Do it before I do. Let's let's look at your comments here. And then I'll do some red and white. And I should really, I'm not going to do the whole painting today, so I'll, I'll leave this broadcast just a little bit short, but let's see what you guys have been saying. I appreciate Donna Lobes. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, let me turn you around and see. I can see you and you can see me. You just never know who's going to show up, <clears throat> do you? And Zamorite Art, good to see you. I just saw you. Mark Toomey again in Brisbane. Brisbane, right? Not Brisbane. Brisbane. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Mark Toomey, the New Zealander. Oh man, the Kiwi? Is that, is that what we call you guys? New Zealander in Australia. Anyway, thanks. And David Mercer, who wins the award as. <laughs> yeah, David. David. 
he number one wins the award of watching me the most in the last month or two, three maybe, and also catching me being arrogant better than anybody else. <laughs> Where would I be without you, David? <laughs> He, he keeping me humble, keeping me humble. I'm sure that's probably in reference to my mentioning that I won the street painting <laughs> competition. Oh, thanks, David. Good to always hear from you. Um, Raymond, you've heard this story before. Man, you must be a regular, buddy. Thank you. Overdoing it again. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> 14 is a nice number. And Zamorite Art, thank you, man or woman. I don't know if you're a man or woman. I think you might be a woman. Forgive me. And Aaron Meadows, hi, Dan. Thank you, guys. Appreciate all your chat. I'll, I'll lick that again in a little while. Okay, I'm going to make a little shift here. Just, I, I, again, trying to paint in a good way. Um, the color red is really important in this. Well, hello, Naveen. <clears throat> Naveen in India. Naveen spends half of his half of his life here in Raleigh and when it gets cold here he escapes to India. Naveen, always nice to hear from you my friend. So red is a, is, I'm showing you the, the photograph here, red there, there, there in the side of this building. I'm going to, and red taillights. I uh, decided to go with a green a traffic light in this painting instead of red and I decided to make this man's shirt red. Zamorite, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for helping me there. Yeah, she's a woman. <laughs> Not that it matters, you know. You just, 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 <laughs> just want to know who I'm talking to or who's talking to me. Okay, so some very important red stuff. And here you see me, I mean, this is, this is right next to tongue painting, isn't it? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am holding the brush in, again, what I would call the <clears throat> legit or painterly grip instead of the control freak grip. But, I, but I'm still holding it. I'm still painting in a pretty controlled manner. Right? So my thinking is, and this I'll go back to the Neil Watson story again. Every time you make a, <clears throat> let me paraphrase my friend, old friend, Neil. <clears throat> Every time you get tight and the tighter you get, you should compensate for that by making some art marks. Okay. So, and again, oh, I know what I was going to say about the, one of the great things about being an artist is you can paint into old age. Here's the other thing I was going to say. Here we go. I know it would come back to me if it was good. And I think it is. That one of the great things about art is that you can improve, let, let's just say painting. It applies there. Let's just talk about painting. You can improve as a painter even when you're not painting like the last this this week here this week in particular i have not done a lot of painting um i've just had a lot of the the, the, uh, the basic infrastructure of business to tend to right lots of you know internet stuff marketing, returning phone calls, returning emails, blah, 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 all the stuff you have to do. Now, did you see that last stroke? That was an art mark. That was an intentional, just make a mess mark. An interesting mess, of course. Did I finish my statement? So that the, the tighter <coughs> that you, you are, the more important it is that you compensate by doing some non-tight, what Neil called art marks. And then I got into one of the great things about painting 
is that you can improve even when you're not painting. So even though I haven't, I myself haven't painted an awful lot this week <clears throat> or in the last two weeks, definitely the last two weeks, I honestly feel like I've improved as a painter because of what I've been thinking about and because what I've been seeing, what I've been looking at. Now, I'm sure you... <coughs> Sorry about that. You could take that to an extreme and say, well, then I'm never going to paint. <laughs> I'll just improve without painting, of course. You know, reductio ad absurdum. No, you can't You can't quit painting altogether, I don't think. You, you have to paint some or draw, whatever it is. But one of the great things about art is you can actually get better in between paintings. You know, again, I, I don't think you would improve as much as when you do paint. Did I say that the right way? Yeah, I mean, paint, because that'll make you improve even quicker. But one of the great things is, you don't have to, you can improve even when you're not painting. <clears throat> and actually, all the stuff I've been saying in the last half hour about looseness and art marks is what I've been thinking about. I think I can get looser than I have been. I mean, of course, that's a safe statement. Almost anybody could make that without any an, <laughs> an analysis. But I, I mean it in a very specific way. I, I can picture, I'm visualizing in my mind what I can do, how I, how I can paint looser. And I can't wait to try it on my next real painting, on my next... Uh, which might, oh, well, actually, that won't be this one. I was going to say, which might be this one. Okay, tomorrow I'm painting, at, and I hope I can broadcast. I'm doing a painting a live event. <clears throat> it's a retirement party for a bank president tomorrow night here in Raleigh. And then uh, Saturday I'm painting a wedding. And I hope that I can bring you guys along for both of those events. As you know, when you paint in public, it's a little bit ticklish. Sometimes it's okay for me to have my camera set up. Sometimes it looks a little bit unprofessional. So I have to use my judgment after I get there. But I certainly hope I can do that. Uh, and as soon as we get a, a decent amount of um, warm weather, I can't wait to... Um, do the yes the somebody just asked am i still going to do the four by seven yes that this is the image that i plan to do there okay so i switched here from doing the red stuff to doing warm white dirty white i often call it Yes, I can't wait to do my four by seven foot canvas, which is down in the garage, taking up an awful lot of room. <laughs> my, my wife will be glad for me to get that out of the garage, too. And yes, it'll be for sale. If anybody wants to paint this, everything I do is for sale. <laughs> And with just about every month that goes by, I am in fewer galleries. Because the galleries <clears throat> keep folding. <laughs> I guess that doesn't reflect very well on the marketability of my paintings, does it? If they have my paintings and they still fold, that means they didn't sell enough of my paintings. Well, there you go. That's true. That is certainly... Certainly not me being humble or arrogant. <laughs> that's downright embarrassing. But that's the way it is. Went and picked up my paintings yesterday, of half a dozen paintings, from a gallery here in Raleigh that's been open since 1968. And they're closing right now. 
kind of sad. I expect to do, after this dries, not tonight, I'm going to let this dry, <clears throat> I expect to do another layer of dark details on this painting. And of course, anytime you do dark on a painting, then your painting's not done in, in my world, because you always finish with light. Why? Because human beings don't like seeing dark paint last. We like seeing light paint last. <laughs> so this is not my, my final hit of, of uh, light stuff. I'll be coming back at least one more time. And of course, with each layer, <clears throat> you cover less and less area of the painting, of the canvas, of the aluminum in this case. I'm going to bring you guys around just a little bit. <clears throat> Maybe give you a final look. By the way, I don't, if you notice, I took my... Usually I have a, a light right over my painting. <clears throat> but on this aluminum, it really wasn't working. So I took the light and moved it way off to my right at an oblique angle. <coughs> Sorry about that. And uh, it makes it a lot easier to see. And again, now what I'm doing with my fingers, besides getting them dirty, <coughs> is, is making a mess. These, this would be called art marks. Everything, just, just making a little mess. I'm sure that the messes that I'm making are intuitive and perhaps even perhaps even more intuitive than I realize because um, I can imagine perhaps it, if I have my students, which I will have my students start doing that, I, can, I don't know that I might find myself less than excited or ecstatic about the, the marks they make. I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's, so maybe, and I'm not being, that is not being arrogant. I'm being ignorant. Maybe I'm, maybe my, like the way I messed up that, that woman's, see that smear? I think it looks good. I think it improved her. And that's an art mark. <clears throat> you might disagree with me and that's all right. You might say I messed it up. I, I wouldn't even try to fight back. I'd just say, well, I think it looks okay. Um... <clears throat> But it might be that I, I have a knack. I, I don't know. I don't know. And again, I'm not being arrogant here, really. I'm, I'm truly being ignorant. I'm uh, just speaking from my personal experience. <clears throat> this is connected to the, the revelation I've had 
um, in recent weeks about that I I haven't give given adequate credit to skill, which is the way your hands move. I'm not talking about mental skill here. I'm talking about physical. And this is related to that, maybe. Okay, David says that the <coughs> traffic light is too small compared to the other stuff. I'm looking at it, David. Do you mean this one or this one? Or do you mean this right here? I'll keep looking. Well, was, <clears throat> let me do this. And I was thinking of going here anyway. So l let me address what David's talking about. I don't know if this will fix it or not. Um, in the photograph, let me bring it into the photograph again real quick. This is a green, and I like very much like the green there. And this actually goes all the way to here. But in my painting, I've changed that. I've made a slight change. I'm making it two separate poles. One is here that has two traffic lights on it and a, and a one-way sign and a street sign. All of this is on one pole. And this, including a, tra a, including a, a street light that is not there at all, are on a different pole. So, and, but this one here is green. It's a dis that very distinct, not uncommon green. The curve one. Okay, David says yes, the curve one. Like, yes, I do think you're right. This this is a little too skinny. And I think it just I hadn't gotten you know, hadn't gotten around to it yet. It impresses me as too skinny too, David. I'm gonna use it using a grease pencil. For those of you who missed the beginning. <clears throat> Yes, Susan, I, I agree. The uh, internet has had a lot to do with the, the demise of um, art galleries. No, I don't. I don't. I don't take <laughs> personal huge responsibility for the failing failures of my the art galleries I was in. It's unfortunate, but yeah, no, I, th I think it's an overall. There's no question it's an overall trend because it's not just not just the galleries I'm in. It's everybody's galleries. So the world is changing, and we have to learn how to change with it. And there's absolutely nothing new about that. Human beings have been doing that for millennia, right? So <clears throat> here, here we are. We're all adjusting. I'm excited about my, the future of my career. It's just, it's just shifting. So here's a question I have. If this pole here is green, should that one? No, I just answered it. Nope, nope. They're both greenish. I don't mind that, but no, I don't want them both the same color green. So there, I was about to ask that question, and as I was saying it, my eyes went boing, boing, boing. No, you don't want them the same color. That's just intuition. I don't know how I know that, but I, I do. <clears throat> and that green, I'm looking at my photograph, yeah. The, the, the green pole that I just made does not look like a pole very much at all. looks like an ugly uh, brush stroke. So we are going to try to fix that. It needs to have some highlight and reflection on it. That's not enough. Let's try more. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate your company. I'm not going to I'm not going to keep this make this broadcast real long. First of all, what I'm doing is just too finicky, too small. It's not doesn't not enough action. There, that's not bad though. That that pole, well, that might be a good place for me to stop. Um, I'll do a little bit more if you don't mind without your company. In in this layer. Generally speaking, I'm quite happy, I think, with the way it's looking. <coughs> and those of you who know me, you understand that the main thing I'm referring to, well, no, 
No, let me be technically correct. I'm referring to two things. This is, for me, the eternal quest. <laughs> I hope it's not eternal, but it's definitely been my objective for the last eight or nine, eight, seven, eight years to be more accurate and more messy. But when I say I like the way something is looking, when I talk about the, my impression right now, it's actually the messiness that, that makes it work for me. Um, I know, just as many of you would understand, you would have the same thing. If, if you just buckle down and zero in and zone in and keep painting, you'll achieve similitude. You'll achieve realism. You'll capture the stuff. I still have a ways to go on all of this. But it's in my mind, it's not the successful capturing of the stuff that makes the painting connect, that makes me smile. It's actually the other stuff, the art marks. I'm going to do this before we go because I, I want I want you to see the the shimmer and glow <laughs> of this as the light moves around. It changes. Be, that's the aluminum. I, I talked. I'll put my light back where it normally goes now. Uh, at the beginning of this this particular painting last Friday, I think it was, um, I talked about my my feeling about painting on aluminum. And I'm going to pick you guys up now give you an earthquake ride so you can just see the different um, what's the word I'm looking for the way the reflection hits differently um, iridescence it almost has an, an iridescent feel um, some people paint on aluminum and they just sew the aluminum and I guess that makes sense if you're thinking about a painting lasting 500 years but if you're thinking about the painting looking interesting, then don't gesso it. Allow the, allow the shimmer of the aluminum to, to, to poke through. And that's certainly a big part, part of what I'm after. Okay, let me see any last, last chats before I go. And uh, we'll call it a day here. <laughs> Susan, Susan comes to my comes to my defense. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's oh no, it's alrighty. It comes to my defense. Sorry, sorry, not Susan. Um, <laughs> thank you, alrighty. <laughs> hey, also known as Bob Ross. Looks like by your picture there. That's cute. Sam right. What's your stance on digital art? It's all that. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's a good question. Is it real art? Uh, sort of, but no, not to the degree that this is real, because it does. It's not a corporeal. You can print out, but the print isn't what you did. The, what you did is on the computer, and you can't touch it. You cannot touch it. So it is art, but it, it cannot be art at the same level as this. And it, the the people might be brilliant and geniuses, but it's not. My definition of art is stuff. The first word is stuff that's made to look at. The first word is stuff. When you do digital art, you're not making stuff. You can print it out, but that's the, the printout is not the stuff. The printout is digital. It's, it's invisible. So anyway, so it is art, just not at the same level. There, that's a short, short, short. Um, Uh, yeah, David, you might be right. I have one gallery that does that, that buys my stuff at a really low price, so I can take it or leave it. Usually I take it. Thanks, guys. I'm going to go. I'm going to cough without your company for, for a little while here. I'll paint for just a little bit longer and then come back and finish this, I hope, in another day or so. Thanks for watching.